welcome back. Um, yes, apologies for the uh, technical difficulties up here. Linux is totally the best desktop operating system and HDMI and projectors always works. Um, anyway, Keith Packard from Hewlett Packard on File System as Storage Manager, the machine library file system. Thank you. Do I have my audio working now? So if you look at your programs, you'll notice that I'm the last thing standing between us and the end of the session. Do we have uh, lightning talks scheduled? Yes. Okay, good. So I won't, I won't feel bad. Um, I will probably not run 40 minutes, um, so we may be able to, may be able to get um, to uh, beer sooner than we expect. Um, I, um, I wanted to, so we, I've been working on the machine program at, uh, at Hewlett Packard Enterprise for a couple of years now. Um, and I realized about, uh, about six months ago, we had, done, had we had done something kind of interesting and really kind of cheeseballish, and I wanted to kind of t show people what we had done and get some feedback. And I was having breakfast with Dave Chinner this morning. He said, oh, yeah, we're doing that with XFS, too. And it's like, oh, okay, well, maybe this is going to be a broader interest than I had feared. Um, it's not all that exciting. It's not a huge amount of technology, but I thought it was interesting enough to share it with you today. Um, uh, so we're, we're doing some, oh no, I'm very sorry, I did not ask for fading uh, slide transitions. <laughs> and I fear we're going to have that all the way through. Um, thank you, LibreOffice, for helping me. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, the, the machine program is, is kind of our first entrant into, the, into this notion of memory-driven computing. Um, Memory-driven computing is a place where um, instead, of using instead of using the processor as the locus of your computation and kind of the focus of your computer architecture, uh, we think your data is a lot more interesting to mo more, more people. And instead of moving your data to the computation, we're actually uh, connecting your computation to your data. Uh, so the goal here is to have as much data, uh, as much memory as you need to hold all of your data, and then let all the processing come to that uh, through magic hardware. Um, of course, uh, and, and one, of the, one of the key tenets of memory-driven computing is the notion that your processor is going to be able to directly access every single byte of, of your entire application's data store with load and store instructions. And here we have a, a simple architectural diagram of what that does to your system. You take your application, which used to be sitting on top of a file system in a disk driver, um, and on top of the disk, the, that horrible rotating rust that we used to use. Um, and you change that so that your application now talks directly to the storage, and the storage is just memory. That's what we mean by memory-driven computing. You get rid of, uh, you, you collapse the storage hierarchy, you get rid of the operating system, so we don't care what the overhead in the kernel is for talking to your Rust anymore because we never touch media. The, all of the computation is directly to memory. Um, you see this in persistent memory, obviously in Linux. Um, uh, Willie did a bunch of uh, effort in the, uh, to do DAX on top of, uh, in, on top of Intel's uh, persistent memory. Um, we don't even use that because we don't need it. Um, the DAX is, DAX is for using legacy file systems. We don't have those legacy file systems. Um, here's what we built for the machine. Uh, the machine is a bunch of computers. Uh, the little SOC DRAM blobs you see up there, those are little Linux computers. Um, as you see, they get smaller and smaller in our world. Uh, I know that each of you runs Linux on your wrists, and you know how small Linux computers can get. Um, so that DRAM and SOC is an ARM 64 processor and just a little bit of DRAM. I think it's about a quarter terabyte. Um, um, and Linux runs entirely in that. Um, and we use, we use a RAM file system because we don't have any storage at all. And when the, when the uh, operating system crashes, we just reboot it because there's no persistent data in that thing. It's completely dataless. All of the data lives in this fabric. And that fabric is all of this fabric attached memory connected together. So I have in this, in this, state, in this thing, I have the 16 blocks of fabric attached memory. They're all connected to that fabric and all, that fabric is connected to every processor. And every processor accesses all of that memory completely symmetrically from an architectural perspective. Obviously, you can see that there are different levels of routing involved and in getting to different pieces of the fabric uh, of the memory, and so there are slight performance variations. But we're using an optical interconnect. We're using very fast switches. And so the latency changes between different areas of the fabric is actually pretty small. Um, the dominant cost of all of this thing is, is the latency of the memory. Uh, for the implementation that we have running today um, that you might have heard about, um, we, aren't, we don't have persistent memory yet because we can't buy enough uh, uh, RERAM or uh, memristors or anything. Uh, so we built something out of DRAM. Um, anybody want to guess how much DRAM you can put into a 19-inch rack and cool it with air? <laughs> I have an answer to that. It's 320 terabytes. You can actually cool that with air. Um, all of the people that work on the machine nearby uh, wear hearing protection. That is earplugs with ear muffs over the top uh, because the uh, level of noise generated by the fans is um, kind, of, uh, kind of impressive. <laughs> yeah. But it is air-cooled. 
<laughs> for a suitably weak definition of air. I think when you compress air enough, yeah. <laughs> Any case. <laughs> yeah. What? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, good point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do refrigerate a lot. Each one of those little compute nodes looks like this. We have a DRAN SOC. We showed that before. And then I have some, uh, some hardware to get between, uh, from me into our memory complex. Now, the thing, that you, uh, the thing that you saw on the previous slide was that I have a lot of Linux computers. Those Linux computers need to have... Um, need, to have, need to all have access to the fabric. But those Linux computers are running independent operating systems, which means that I need to have a layer of protection between the, the operating system and the hardware. And I don't want to do that in some lame virtualization disaster. No, I want physical protection from the, hard, from the SOC to all of that memory out there. And so I actually have another address mapping. I have a firewall, and I have this uh, media controller, the Gen Z controller. Uh, Gen Z is a new interconnect that uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise developed and has, and has uh, made the specifications open so that other people can do it. Uh, the Gen Z consortium is a, uh, something that we announced uh, last fall. Um, it's, a, it's a replacement for every single bus in your computer. Um, it can't, it could be. Um, there's a bunch of members, IBM's a member of that uh, Gen Z consortium, a bunch of other uh, people as well. I, Red Hat might be, I don't remember. Uh, you can go look at the Gen Z consortium. But I, I can actually tell you the name of this switch now. If anybody's seen my previous presentations, you will, the, the Gen Z name was carefully masked with other names, but now I can actually tell you that it's the Gen Z stuff because that's, uh, that's real. Um, so we have this firewall between us. And I have this huge pile of memory that's shared by a bunch of Linux computers. OK, so I have a huge pile of storage, or DRAM in this case, and I have a bunch of machines that want to be able to access it and, and like par cut off partitions of it and, and, uh, and provide you know, like naming and access control and like storage allocation. What, is, what do we do in Linux when we want those three attributes? Uh, we create a file system, yeah. Uh, so when I showed up at the project a couple years ago, um, the researchers had this glorious abstraction of, uh, of, um, of a retail memory broker and a wholesale memory broker, and had they, had all, they had all these new APIs for doing allocation and doing naming and access control. And I said, you know, I think I have an API that looks a lot like that. Yeah. So I came in and just kind of and, and looked at their lovely little uh, slideware presentations and said, yeah, we'll, we'll provide you APIs that do what you want. Yeah, they're called POSIX APIs. <laughs> so here's what we built, uh, Linux for the machine. Uh, all of this source code is up on uh, GitHub in the Fabric Attached Memory uh, project. Um, you can actually see all the bits here. Um, uh, uh, we have an external box that actually does the management of the storage. So I have, remember I have all those Linux computers sitting there and they all have to have access control and they all have to have like, uh, they can only touch the stuff they're allowed to touch. Well, that means none of those Linux computers are actually in charge of allocating storage within the memory array. All of that allocation is done within this management server uh, outside of the system. And in fact, that management server is not even connected to the fabric. You'll note that it has, it's just another separate little box. And in fact, it's a standard x86 server because I needed that box to stay up. And when you build brand new hardware with a brand new processor and really brand new memory chips and a brand new fabric and brand new network controllers, and um, you really want something else to be running something that has to have stable, reliable storage. Um, and so I bought uh, one of our, our machines off the rack and stuck it in the same room and connected it via network cable. Uh, so the librarian is responsible for doing all of, the, all of the file system metadata management. And the awesome part about doing file system metadata management is it doesn't actually have to ever see the data. And in fact, it has no access to the fabric itself. Um, OK, so the architecture that I came up with was kind of hokey. Um, but we wanted to go fast, and we wanted to do things simply. And we wanted to do things securely. OK, so one of, the, uh, one of the tenets of the machine is security is something that we do every day. Security is something that we have uh, in en every engineering project of the machine. Uh, there is either somebody from the security team or a security expert or somebody who has a relationship with a security expert and knows how to call them in on, on demand. So everything in the machine is, has security designed in uh, from the very start. So all the, all the reviews of all the protocols, it's like, OK, where are you getting your TLS keys? How are you doing two-way uh, two authentication? How are you managing all this stuff? Well, for the librarian, it's an external box connect connected via network. I can't just talk regular network protocols at that. I have to have security. So I have to use TLS, which means that talking to uh, creating a file system that is now basically a 
The file system data is local, but the metadata is all over a network, so it looks like a network file system. So now I have to go out through the network, and I want to be able to do my network securely, so I want to be able to run uh, TLS over that. So what I did is I, I stole the Fuse file system inside the kernel, and I hacked the heck out of it, and now I have this Fuse protocol that talks to the LFS proxy, and that LFS proxy then packages up those Fuse requests into little JSON bits and spits it over a TLS secured connection to the librarian. So now I have a file system which is kind of stacked several layers deep in kind of kludgy code. Um, but it kind of works. Um, one of the reasons that we can do this is the data block size that we allocate in the librarian file system is, is the smallest securable size unit in the machine. I remember I showed you a picture that had the firewall. That firewall has uh, access control for the CPU and it uses these small chunks of memory we call books because they're a collection of pages. They're actually eight gigabytes in size. So the allocation unit within the file system is eight gigabytes, uh, which means that I don't expect to do a lot of fine grain allocation over this thing. I have 320 terabytes of memory in the largest uh, machine we could conceivably build today. That's 40,000 pages. And you think, oh, 40,000, that's a really small number compared to the memory that I have available. I could do things like arrays for my allocation. I could do all kinds of simplistic allocation strategies. It was awesome. It's like, oh, I think we're gonna do this really simply. And so the, the LFS proxy is written in Python. Uh, the librarian is written in Python. They communicate via JSON. So you do, a, you do like a, a create a file and you get the, uh, the, the POSIX API, you know, you get a little, you get a little uh, CREAT system call into the library and file system, which sends a, uh, basically a fuse request up to the LFS proxy, which then takes that fuse request and packages it up in JSON and sends it over a TLS connection to the librarian. The librarian does a little metadata management, does a little, uh, uh, the metadata uh, database is actually stored in SQL Lite. <laughs> because I wanted transactions. So it's like, oh, well, I, want a, I want a database here. Oh, I'll steal an SQLite database because those are reliable and secure and stable and somebody else's problem. Um, so, and then of course it wends its way back. So does that sound like it's gonna be quick and zippy? Eh, not so much. Um, we expect to be able to operate, you know, hundreds to thousands of file systems and tra transactions per second. Um, Dave, what's the typical XFS transaction speed if you wanted to create a direct create a file how long how long would that take yeah yeah in my world milliseconds it's awesome <laughs> and I just don't care you could maybe create 40,000 files in the system okay so I don't have very many files um, and that's okay um, because I think this is the same picture uh, I'm sorry um, th th this shows a, li a little more bit of it the metadata lives in that database um, and uh, remember we talked about that firewall? Well, sadly, the hardware architects did something crazy. Uh, that firewall, the, uh, the, the hardware that can actually touch and program that firewall, which is supposed to be under the operating system, is the SOC on the node. <laughs> it's like, uh, hello? It's not supposed to be reachable by the operating system, and here you have given me hardware which can only be reached by the SOC, which is running the operating system. Um, <laughs> Thanks, guys. So what we did is we used this ARM64 trust zone stuff, which is a horror show. Um, <laughs> do not like trust zone. Um, and then I have this proxy. So the, the librarian talks to this Python fire, firewall proxy, which sends the, trust, the uh, firewall updates into this trust zone piece of software. And there's magic to make sure that that is actually notionally secure. The other piece here is that when you have a local file system, you just want to have an X4 file system that has persistent data for your node. Well, the only place you can put persistent data is into that fabric attached memory because the, everything else is RAM. There's no media available to this thing. So if you want a persistent file system for a node, what you're gonna do is create a local file system on top of one of those things you just allocated, right? I've got this giant chunk of fabric attached memory. And that's what this talk is about, is how do you connect that local file system to that librarian file system? Because you want a couple of things here. Remember, we really wanna be able to do direct access which means that I need to have some way of getting the direct access block API visible on that librarian file system. Um, and that's what, that's what we call this, this two-level allocator. Remember, the librarian allocates things in eight gigabyte chunks. Um, sometimes people use files that are smaller than that, uh, and sometimes they want more than 40,000 files. So what we expect people to do, and in fact, what's designed here, is we have this block store API on top of the librarian and then you can just do an X4 or XFS file system on top of that. 
So we have this kind of this extent manager that's allocating these huge chunks of memory, and then we have a little retail file system or a retail allocator uh, on top of that. The reason that I want to expose this librarian file system to applications and not just hide it inside the operating system is that I have a lot of applications that want to be able to directly access an enormous amount of data, say, you know, 200, 300 terabytes of data. I don't want them going through a four kilobyte or even a 64 kilobyte page granularity uh, allocation uh, adventure to allocate 300 terabytes of memory. I really want to take advantage of these eight gigabyte books that I have and have a very lightweight translation between virtual address or file offset uh, to physical address. And the, and the librarian file system gives me that. It's extremely efficient at that. It's like, okay, I have uh, 12 books in this, in this um, 96 terabyte or 96 gigabyte file. There's only 12 entries in my array. Oh, I'm in offset 80 gigabytes. So linear array access here plus done. And so when I'm filling in a PTE for a, for a page fault uh, that you take in the middle of one of these librarian file systems, it's very fast because the, there's no walking of a complicated data structure. So that's kind of nice. Uh, and of course, the database people are always, well, just give me a raw device because database people are like that. It's like, well, here's your raw device. It's a file system. <clears throat> so that's the allocation strategy. Um, so here's, what I, here's my question. My question is, why are we still using, or why do we, why do we think that DM is the right way to do storage management in a, in a system at large? DM is kind of kludgy, right? You can create, resize, delete, rename, list, and, and for DM, you have these L LVM2 uh, uh, user mode commands <coughs> that manage your storage, uh, but you also have you know, regular file system commands to do exactly the same things. For, for most of what you want to do with DM, um, in my environment, I have complete parallels for the file system commands, and I have a tremendous advantage in that even simplistic users like me uh, remember most of those commands, whereas for LVM2, how many of you read the man page before invoking any one of those commands? That would be me, because I never know what they're going to do. I would love to have. I, instead, I spent 10 minutes making this slide with, with, uh, with uh, GraphViz. Um, <laughs> Yeah, which is, which is kind of fun. So now I, have, I, now I have this idea in my head, wait a minute, shouldn't we be doing this more generally in Linux I as a whole, right? Uh, if you look at something like, uh, something like a, a, a classic hardware managed RAID array, it offers you a single device that's the entire store, right? DM, one of DM's tremendous advantages uh, over, over the Linux file system is the ability to add devices and spread your file system across these new devices, right? Uh, you, can, you can add in a new chunk of storage into DM uh, with the physical volume stuff, and now you have more physical volumes, and you can take your uh, file system and resize it across more physical volumes. Well, in my, in, my, in my environment, I can do that too. I can plug in a new node, and now I've got new memory, and my library and file system grows to cover the new memory. And now I can, take, I can partition that out. Uh, one of the slides I didn't put in here that I meant to do after talking with Dave this morning, I'm so sorry, um, is uh, one of the other things you desperately want to be able to do in my environment is you want to be able to tell the system where to allocate the storage, right? Uh, in, in my environment, um, if you look at that picture again, we can go back, see if I can figure out how to go back. Yeah, so here we have here we have the picture of the machine. So if you have some storage that you want to be able to that you want to be able to spread uniformly across the system, so that all the machines can kind of access it uh, with more or less uh, more or less the same performance, then what you probably want to do is you want to allocate that you want to allocate the books across the entire system, maybe randomly, uh, maybe sequentially, maybe uh, maybe strided in some way, depending upon the structure of your data. So what we did is we used extended attributes, and we have this way of telling the extended attribute. Um, I want this book from this file allocated in this, in this relationship to my processor. I want this book allocated in this relationship. And you can specify either specifically where you want all the pages allocated, or you can say, I want, um, you, I want this page to be allocated on, on a node which is not mine. 
Uh, for instance, if you want to be able to do a failure recovery, it's like, okay, I need a book that's allocated under this power supply and this, uh, this um, Gen Z switch, and I need a book that's allocated by this power supply and this Gen Z switch, so that if I lose power over here, the data is still preserved over here and I can still access it. So you want to be able to control in a very fine grain where everything is allocated. We did this with, uh, with um, two, well, actually an array, of course, because, uh, because Linux is... In Linux's infinite wisdom, uh, uh, extended, uh, extended attributes are, can be a maximum of 64 kilobytes. And so I have basically per book in the, in, the, in the file, I have a where do you want this book to be allocated? And you, spe you specify. And then I have policies that, that you do for books that you haven't, that for entries you haven't made in that book. So if you, make a, if you say, I don't care, then I have a general, a general uh, policy in another extended attribute that says, if there is no specific allocation for that book, then do this. And the, the, the this might be an, an, allocate randomly, or it might be allocate on this node, or it might be allocate in this, uh, in this, uh, in this failure domain of the system. So there's a bunch of different policies. So that directs the allocation of the books in a specific way. And then I have a second set of extended attributes that you can query that says where the things actually got allocated. I used extended attributes for a couple of reasons. Uh, reason number one, I have user mode commands already existing that I can simply script with shell scripts and uh, configure the system the way I want. Reason number two is when I back up and restore the system, the requested location and the actual location of every book is now preserved in the backup because all competent backup software preserves extended attributes, right? I don't actually know. Uh, the backup system that we wrote does preserve the extended attributes, <laughs> oddly. Um, and that means that, w so the awesome thing is you can now back up your entire system and it's going to preserve both where the books were allocated and it's going to preserve where the application wanted the books to be allocated so that when you restore the system, you can choose whether you want the data to come back in exactly where it was or the data to come back in where the application wanted it to be. And this was really important for our performance analysis because our performance analysts wanted to be able to take an application, uh, take the data off the machine, and then put it back in the machine and rerun the thing and have exactly the same performance data come back out. And so that was uh, critical to them. Uh, to, to be able to do the backup and restore. So that was a pretty simple mechanism, and it seems like extended attributes can cover a lot of the other missing gaps in the, the DM API right now that a file system wouldn't cover. I don't know what else there is to be done. Uh, that was all I needed. Let's see. We're here. We're here. Here's a normal system, of course, applications and, and LVM utilities. The applications talk to the file system, which talks to the DM driver. I'm sorry, I can't spell. Uh, and that talks to the raw devices. And of course, there can be a lot of raw devices with a lot of different device drivers. Um, and of course, in a file system managed system, then I have this wholesale file system, which, I, which is the librarian file system. And then you can have a user file system on top of that that just allocates. And so from, the, from user space, the mechanisms look the same. You just use different utilities to do the file system management. And those utilities are ones that the user already is presumably familiar with. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about today was that you can actually play with all of this stuff today um, in, in, uh, in Anger on a real system. Um, and the way that we did that with, uh, is, is, of course, through emulation. And we emulate the fabric attached memory environment uh, by running a bunch of uh, fake nodes, those nodes that you saw, on, on top of a single hypervisor and using the Ivy Shemem stuff to, to create this fabric attached memory that they all share. Um, and then I hacked up the hyper hypervisor to make that Ivy Shemem thing actually map into a, a file. So it actually persists across hypervisor reboots, which is kind of cool. So now you get this persistent fabric attached memory, which is sitting in RAM on the hypervisor and is shared by all, the, all, these, uh, all these virtual machine nodes. So you can actually do programming in the machine. Um, this stuff is also all on that fabric attached uh, memory uh, GitHub page. So you can actually build up a little synthetic machine. Um, and I can show anybody who wants a demo of how that works on my laptop, but it isn't directly germane to this. Um, so I just wanted to talk about that. So in case you wanted to go see how this works, you can actually go get the bits today, uh, which is kind of cool. And that happened last week. Uh, so the benefits, obviously, of using uh, the, uh, the uh, device manager and the LVM stuff is you get RAID, right? Uh, using a file system, unless the file system supports RAID internally, uh, you don't get RAID. Well, for DAX, you can't use RAID anyhow. 
right? As soon as you tar start talking about direct access, you're doing load store operations from the processor right to the device. And that means there's no, there's no di intermediating OS layer that's going to be able to mux out your requests and do the hashes necessary to get the RAID to work. So I don't get RAID in my environment anyhow, so it's no loss to me. Uh, obviously, uh, one of the nice things about DM is you get the ability to do multiple devices with multiple different drivers, um, and that's pretty cool, but I only have one device because everything's memory, right? So it wasn't a big deal for me. Um, obviously, if, you're, if you go to my FS management, um, now we get uh, DAX. Um, oh, I didn't even talk about that at all. So the way that I made this work, uh, I'm sorry, uh, was that I actually stuck a, a, a block layer API into my file system. So my file system is both the file system and a block layer driver. Um, and, I, and, when you, and you take an existing shelf and you do Muknod with the same name, then it actually makes a block device using the same storage. So it, obviously your, your file gets replaced uh, with a block device, and now you can just mount a file system right on top of it. Um, you can't resize it anymore, which is obviously bad. And so I need to think more about how this is going to work and figure out a set of APIs for exposing a block device API to put a file system on top of, on top of a file system. So I need to work a little bit more on that. Um, but by embedding the block device right inside uh, the file system, I was able to expose um, a DAX which I can't do out of the file system because the file system doesn't provide enough information to the loop device in order to get DAX to go all the way through. So the only way I could get a DAX-enabled X4 file system to run on top of my crazy uh, file system was to implement the block layer right in my file system. Obviously, you get to use regular shell tools. Um, and heck, you can even use directories and put your block devices as like, you know, Fred's, uh, Fred's block devices and George's block devices are now in separate directories. And so they aren't in a flat namespace like they would be uh, in the traditional block storage and uh, traditional uh, DM and DM world, uh, and I wanted to say thanks. And if there are any questions, I think we have about five minutes. Everybody's ready for beer, which is fine. I have a question back here. Sorry, you're second. Hey, so you said what? Directory, so does that mean that now just to say that there exists a directory now takes cost you eight gigabytes? No, no, the directories are just metadata, remember? Oh, okay. There's no, there's the, the, the data blocks are strictly for file data blocks. So all the metadata is stored in a SQLite database, it takes no storage at all. Because SQLite's free, right? Uh, I, transactional memory is, is something that's really a cache, a, uh, a, the way the processor interacts with its own cache, um, and how ca when cache flushing happens. So that it, you, could do you could do transactional memory on top of this fabric attached memory because it's just, it just looks like memory. Um, so it's, it's all compatible, but they aren't really directly related in any way other than it's memory. So you could do transactional stuff against this memory as well, yeah. I think you're missing an opportunity to plug the user space libraries to implement transactions on top of this uh, persistent memory. <coughs> we have a lot of user space libraries, and I didn't talk about those. I, you, you a question back there, and then you got a question up here. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that CephFS actually also uses extended attributes for storing the layout of the file. Oh, do they really? Okay. Yeah. Great, great minds think alike, or? <laughs> no, I like the idea, but you're, you know, you're glossing over the fact that you, I don't, you no longer have to look at the LVM man pages, but you have to look at the man page for what's the extended address. Yes. So yes. it's you know, just shifting that particular problem. Yeah. Well, the, one of the nice things that we actually added late in the process was these fairly simple um, policies instead of explicit allocation mechanisms. And so there's just a small handful of common policies. It's like random local, uh, local node or not local node or local enclosure or not local enclosure. So we have like uh, four different policies that are pretty common. So, yeah, yes, there are additional, you do need, if you want to do fun, exciting, complicated things, yes, you do have to go find the appropriate man page. Sorry about that. So you were talking about uh, rebooting and you could, you could uh, boot from the, the fabric attached memory and all that sort of thing. What happens at boot up time? How do you bootstrap this whole thing? Uh, the fabric attached memory appears as a device. But right? if you power it off. Oh, so how do you, how do you power, how do you the, they pixie boot. 
Yeah. Okay, so it's all it's all network attached to uh, yeah. booting. Uh, and yes, that means that they are loading the root file system with all the security stuff necessary to talk to the fabric right over, uh, right over UDP unsecured. From, from where? Right over from that uh, management server. Yeah, the management server. Yes, so there would be a security gap there. Um, there, are, there are people ta uh, figuring out how to do, um, there's a UEFI spec on doing secure booting and stuff, and we're working on that, but it does uh, pixie for now. Thank you much, and thanks for coming this afternoon. Are we done today? We have, I, I'll be here all week, of course. Uh, come, and, come and bug me. I'm doing another presentation on Wednesday as well. Okay, um, please thank Keith. <clears throat>